Hi everyone, my name is Stephanie Joy Phillips. I'm the founder of World Childless Week. Thank you for joining us on the first webinar of World Childless Week on the first day for 2021. I'm joined today by the amazing Sarah Roberts and wonderful Judy Graham, who are going to do a webinar called Telling Our Stories From Hurting to Healing. So I'm now going to disappear off the screen and leave it to them to go forward. Thanks, Steph. Hi. Go, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks, Steph. And thank you so much for setting up World Childless Week. We are so blessed, so blessed you've created this space for us. I just wanted to start, which is what we do uh, in Australia, is with a, an acknowledgement of country, a recognition of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander traditional owners. So Judy and I want to acknowledge the Yagara, Turrbal and Yagambe peoples the traditional owners of the Brisbane and Gold Coast region, regions where we are located. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connection to land, sea and culture. We recognise their valuable contribution to Australian and to global society. And we wanted to say a particular welcome to everybody who's come and joined us this evening. Judy. Thanks, Sarah. And yeah, thanks, Steph, for that lovely introduction. And I just want to say a huge congratulations for World Child Childless Week and the fifth year of World Childless Week. It's such an enormous amount of work and you do such a wonderful job. So thank you for bringing this to all of us. Um, welcome, everybody from all over the world. Um, thanks for being with us and Sarah I also wanted to say thank you for doing that lovely acknowledgement I think it's yeah it's such a it's such a important place to start to recognize First Nations people and also I think you know First Nations people are known for storytelling and the importance of storytelling for culture and identity and that seems a really fitting place to start our webinar tonight around telling stories. So that recognition of the power of telling our stories. So thank you for starting us off. Um, I guess I wanted to also start by touching in with people and, and asking you, have you submitted a story for World Childless Week? Or have you already read some of the stories on World Childless Week website? Because there's so much to see there. And if you haven't had a chance to visit the website and read those stories before, I really encourage you to have a look. Um, you know, Steph has beautifully laid them out and there's different themes and there's such heart and beauty in each of those stories that I think seeing so many stories together is, is just so powerful. And it's part of building our community. You know, people are, are reading other stories and finding connection and supporting each other and doing our own healing in the process. So I really encourage you to, to look at those stories and read them. Um, and, I, you know, I can see some comments coming through that some people feel like, you know, they've been brave enough to, to share their story. And I think that's really valid. That's what we're going to be talking about tonight. You know, what does it take to share your story? What does that, what does that mean for you? Um, and what does that mean in terms of, you know, the healing and growth that can come with that? So Sarah and I did want to start today by, um, I guess, just recognising that we're all at different stages of sharing or telling our stories of childlessness. And, um, you know, in our work as childless therapists and group facilitators, quite often we, we talk to women who haven't been able to share their story before. Um, maybe it's the first time that they've told their story. And, 
you know, that might be because they haven't had the words to tell their story or the emotional safety to tell their story or the right people in their world to tell their stories too. Um, or perhaps they've tried to tell their story and they've been brushed aside or shut down or not heard or judged or given unsolicited, unhelpful advice. So they've stopped sharing their story. So I feel like we've probably all been at that point at some point. I know, I know that I have. Um, so I guess we just want to start by acknowledging that, that different people will be at different spaces, different places when it comes to telling their story. And I guess no matter where you're at in terms of the process of coming to terms with your childless experience, um, with telling your story, whether that's a private internal story or reading and listening to other stories, or perhaps you're in a space where you're sharing your story more publicly um, or in different situations, wherever you're at, that's the right place for you. Um, and I guess if you've been watching um, webinars like this, uh, or watching other interviews or, you know, hearing people, you know, share their stories publicly. Um, also kind of just want to acknowledge that, um, you know, you, you might be thinking, oh, wow, I could never do that. Or, um, wow, I could never speak up publicly about my childless story. Um, is that what it looks like to be healed? Is, is that the place I have to get to, to be in a healing place, to be able to share my story publicly? And the answer is no, no. You don't have to get to a place of sharing your story publicly to, to be in a place of healing. You know, it is absolutely possible to be in a place of healing and, and growth without having to share your story in that way. So most people won't ever share their stories publicly like this. Um, and that's absolutely fine. Um, so what we're talking about tonight is about sharing your story and finding the ways that you can and need to do that, that are right for you and that are right for you at this time. So we're gonna look at um, some strategies that might help you in that process. And, and yeah, Sarah and I are just going to talk a little bit back and forth around um, some of our experiences around supporting people who tell their stories. So we'll invite you to settle in and take a deep breath as we start to kind of unpack this idea of telling our stories of childlessness. So the word story has different associations and different meanings for different people. So that might be the place to start. Sarah, do you want to help sort of us unpack this idea of what it means to tell our story? That is such a good question. And you've done such a beautiful introduction there, um, Judy, to really affirm that it's a very individual experience. It's a very individual journey um, and what we might choose to share, the details we might share, where we're at in our journey can change over time as well as the journey itself can be really complex and our own stories can change and we're actually living our stories. What I wanted to, um, to touch on is that, that we bring like a really unique perspective um, both as uh, therapists who specialize in involuntary childlessness you know that's our specialist area we're both grief therapists and we we both work from a trauma-informed perspective and um you know we're both childless women and I know that 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 you and I will tell different parts of our stories in different ways in different times and what I wanted to really emphasize which really is about um being trauma informed is the most important thing is your emotional safety that is the most important number one priority in terms of sharing our stories 
So when it comes to our stories, we, we have stories that we might tell verbally. We might, you know, tell stories to, to ourselves. It might be our inner thoughts. It might be the stories that we're living. A lot of us will, will do things like journaling or writing or blogging. Often in the early days of our grief and, and the early time of coming, you know, coming to a place of, um, of healing in terms of our childlessness, the focus in those early days of storytelling really is about healing and about making sure that our safety and our care is really important. And in those early days, it can be really important to create sanctuary and safety in our lives, um, realising that, you know, we might have some really tough stuff to process. Um, the stories we might also tell might be the stories we tell to others. It might be in online forums. It might be anonymously. It might be through social media. And uh, I know one of the things that we talk about often, Judy, is um, that sometimes on social media, people will present very curated stories of their own lives. And it can be really hard when you're in a place of struggle, you're feeling really vulnerable and raw. It can be really hard to see, you know, shiny pictures of people who seem to have come out the other side and, and to just think that just doesn't feel like that's ever going to be me. And I guess one of the things that I, I know about everybody who's public in terms of involuntary childless, childlessness is that each of us have been through our own dark journey, our own night of the soul. Um, and that it's you know, really important for us to share those vulnerable parts of ourselves as well. Then there's a story we might tell to trusted others. That might be to a therapist, to close friends, to other childless women and men, other people who validate and see our stories. And as you said, absolutely no need to tell our stories, no pressure, um, but to realise that each of our stories as involuntary childless people is precious and it's really important to honour our stories and our journeys. One thing I did want to say is that, that, that you've touched on, Judy, is that often when women come in and talk to us, so many women will say to me, this is the first time I've, I've actually ever spoken to another involuntary childless woman. This is the first time I've ever told my story. And it's really important in that space for us to be able to say, hey, this is really normal for someone who's going through involuntary childless what you're describing and what you're experiencing is very much um, part of our shared experience and I guess that's why World Childlessness Week is so precious because it gives us a chance to see um, you know I looked through some of those beautiful posts that came up today and just thought I just so recognize those really dark painful places and and to just say yeah we see you we really do get you so I guess that kind of brings us up to the next question, Judy, which is around, as you reflect on the process of telling stories, why would we want to tell our stories? Why would we want to do that? Yeah, good question. I think there's, there's so many reasons as to why we want to tell our stories and why we need to tell our stories as well. Um, and, you know, just even thinking about the different ways that people might tell their stories, you know, sort of verbally or written or maybe posts on, on you know, closed Facebook groups or, or publicly. Um, it reminded me of um, a, a friend of mine and she's also a single woman who's childless and we catch up from time to time and... Often it's at an event or an activity or something. She's a really social person and likes to be doing things. Um, and I go along for the ride. Um, but whenever I go out with her, she always takes photos. So she, she has it almost like as a bit of a practice. Yeah. And, and not only does she take photos of, of us and the activity that we're doing, but she asks someone else who's nearby to take the photo of us. So it's not a selfie, it's a, hello, we're here, can you take a photo of us? And we have these little interactions. But when I asked her about that, because it very much is a practice, it's not just some random thing, oh, we better do it. Um, and her response was, 
well, I, I don't have anyone else taking photos of me. I don't have a partner. I don't have children or a dog or the reasons that other people take photos of me. And so if I don't get these photos and I don't record them, then it's like there's no record of me. Yeah, yeah. And that's huge, isn't it? It's enormous. And yeah. It's enormous. And so she has found this way of telling her story and recording her story. And, and that's also saying that she's visible, that yeah. she's, she's present in life. And here's this record of her doing the things that she loves. And I feel yeah. really um, privileged because I get to be in, in her photo story <laughs> and we share these activities. She's recording your life too. <laughs> She, she's recording my life too. And, and I think, you know, that's it, you know, unless we record it, because we don't always have these opportunities for special events where we're part of that. Um, we, we can find ways to take ownership of our stories and, and do that on our terms. And yeah, not be embarrassed about taking selfies or, or being involved. Yes. We're being present. Yes. So you know, I guess that's one reason, isn't it, that we might want or need to tell our stories, to be visible, to be recording those experiences so we can look back and we can share them with others. And, you know, I guess there's, there's a number of other reasons why it's important to share our story while we might want to. And you touched on it a bit, Sarah, and that's around around recognition and validation. So, you know, I guess they're kind of counselling each terms a little bit, but um, we, we often want to or need to tell our stories to be recognised, but also to receive validation. Yeah. So when we tell our stories, we, we need to be heard and we need to be validated so that we actually know that our experience is is normal or is okay and that our emotional experience is is valid so recognition and validation is it's an important part of emotional well-being and psychological well-being and and if we don't get that you know that that is the stuff that shuts us down and it can make us feel like we're we're not worthy or we're not we're not valid Um, we're not important. So recognition and validation is, is an, a crucial reason why we might need to tell our stories. Yeah. It's part of our healing. It's part of yeah. our grief work. It's part of making sense of what our experience has been. So yeah. I think, yeah, the really important part is that we need to share our stories with others. Yeah. So we can do that on our own for so long. Yeah. But the problem with just doing it on our own is that sometimes if we've been shut down or, um, yeah, not validated, that our, our mind will actually start creating its own stories. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, our mind will make up a story about not being validated, about not being heard. And, you know, our minds might actually, you know, make sense of that experience and and start to tell ourselves the story that we're not important that we're different that you know we we don't matter and so you know this idea of validation is really really important because it means that we have to share our story with others and receive that recognition yeah I could so relate to that Judy particularly what you the story you told about um your friend who documents her life. And and I have had other childless women that I've known personally, but also through my my um my counseling work, who can get to certain points where they may have never had, for example, a wedding day, or they may never have had um uh, you know, all the stuff that comes along with um, you know, children is one of the things that happens with children is it's like you, it's less it's not so much that you're documenting your own life. What you're actually doing is you're documenting your child's life, like all those childhood memories. And there's this drive to actually be capturing it. Um, 
And one of the things that has been a really beautiful healing thing for some of the women I've worked with has been to actually book themselves in for a professional photography session um, and to actually go in and see, like it might be, you know, even a friend who they know who's a, who's a very good photographer, but to actually have a set of, when they're ready for it, a really beautiful set of midlife portraits that they can that they can hang around the house. Um, and it's such a beautiful way to say, I exist and I matter. Um, and yeah. even if you're not quite feeling that, it's actually like an action that you can take that, that asserts that a little bit in the world, which kind of makes me really think about what the culture around us tells us, which is essentially there's not stories of us. The way that the culture rises and meets us is through those completely stupid, ignorant, offensive, sometimes hostile comments that get made to us. And what that is, is that's about actually saying we don't exist. Our stories don't exist. Our stories don't matter. And it's, it's, in, it's in a way, it's even sometimes in a quiet, gentle, nurturing way for us to actually say, I, I challenge that. I actually challenge that. Yeah. This is my quiet rebellion, if, you, if we're wanting a, a word. Um, you know, and to do that from a place of, because, you know, we know what it means to be in struggle and to hurt and, and being able to just do that really gentle resistance to that. Um, it really allows a little bit of movement um, as we're working our way through. Yeah. So I'm sure I, you've got such good ideas around the other reasons it's really helpful to, yeah. um, to share our stories. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. And I think what you said there, it's like this, that first or finding ways to share our stories. It, it's part of a process, isn't yeah. it? So when we're talking about sharing our stories, you know, it's not about kind of leaping out into the world and, and sharing our story with everyone. It's, it can be very much a process. And, and so what we're talking about tonight is how, where are you at in that process? What's good for you? What's safe and, and healing? I can, you know, I know some women, you know, when they're, and men, when they share their stories of childlessness can feel a real sense of empowerment. And, and I guess in some ways that might tell a, a little story itself of what was the context of, of where, you, where you shared that and, and did you receive validation back? and recognition or you know where are you choosing to share your story that meets your needs yeah. because that's part of it isn't it you know some of the other reasons that we tell our stories are for emotional needs for emotional yeah. support so if we're really raw in our stories and we haven't actually had other people to share our stories with it's very likely that that we need that emotional support um, and we need to work out where we can get that. You know, who are the people in our lives that might be trusted and safe that we can open up a little bit and, and start to share some of what's really happening? Um, and, and not everyone has those people in their lives. So it might be a therapist that they're telling for the first time because they need some emotional support to then work out what are the next steps? How do I come to terms with my, my grief and my loss? And who I'm, who I am, and who mm. I I want to be. Mm. So emotional support is is a reason we share our stories, but but also healing and growth and empowerment. Um, you know, taking taking a, back a sense of who we are and wanting yeah. to be able to to tell those stories and be recognised further afield. Yeah. So you know, we share it for healing and growth. Um, maybe some, you know, some at some point we get to a place where we, we just don't want to tolerate the, the being invisible and we go, okay, I want to feel more empowered and I have the emotional safety to be able to do that. Mm. Um, we, make, we, we share our stories to make sense of our world and to make sense of our experience. So, you know, when we talk about this idea of, not being not not kind of being able to get that validation alone this, this is this dialogue you know telling our story is actually where we we dialogue with someone else 
or whether that's through the sharing online communities or telling someone. But this is how we start to make sense. We say things out loud and we, we check in with someone else yeah. who we trust. So we, we need to make sense of the world, yeah. of our world. Yeah. And stories help us do that. Yeah. And making sense is a really important part of the meaning making. Um, you know, that, that, you know, in grief therapy, we talk about meaning making, which is you're making sense. You're looking at your identity and you're looking at, you know, constructing a narrative out of your experience and it helps you make sense of it. The other thing I guess I wanted to touch on, which which we've kind of briefly touched on is, is and I wanted to acknowledge, we have this beautiful global community of, of leaders in our community who've told their stories, who've been really active around challenging the culture. And often that arises out of a place of looking around and, and seeing how we're treated and feeling the sense of sometimes anger. And anger can, can be an emotion that we feel as we're going through the grief and it can be a really active emotion that allows us to process through grief. But there's also another kind of anger, which is a righteous anger. And righteous anger um, is an anger that people who've been, uh, who've articulated, who've been subject to things like, you know, racism or to homophobia or to sexism. It's, it's a sense of an anger that rises, which is out of a desire for justice. And so it can be so important. I just really want to acknowledge the people who are, who are talking out publicly to challenge the culture and really allowing our voices to be heard. Um, and like you said, we might not all get to that place, but, but yeah, it's, it's really important work to start changing that culture so that down the track in the future, I know that you and I were really isolated when we were traveling through our, our childlessness grief and how precious it was for us to um, be able to find others telling their stories and, and feel this sense of me too, really. Like it's, it's our me too movement where we get to to ride ourselves into the culture and, and to say that we exist and to actually really challenge, you know, whether it's social policy, whether it's the way in which we're, you know, engaged with. Um, and that can really vary over time, can't it? Yeah. Absolutely. And, and I think, you know, that's so right in that, um, yeah, I certainly felt... Um, like there weren't other voices um, around much when, you know, almost 10 years ago when I was coming to terms with my childlessness and, you know, hearing other voices, hearing, you know, reading Jodie Day's book, these were the things that helped go, ah, oh, I'm not alone. I'm not, yeah. you know, I'm not, I don't yeah. need to be an outcast. And how do, that, that planted the seeds of how do yes. I start to, address my own story and tell it to myself yeah. even yes. <laughs> and then to be able to slowly little bit by little bit tell others you know yeah. I I often think of my own story as you know like it it really is like you know this this precious onion <laughs> that you know at the heart of my story at the center of my story is is the most raw and detailed story that really only I will ever know and the telling of my story doesn't start there it actually starts with those outside layers of that onion and the the first kind of skin that I think is this safe enough to tell and I might tell a piece of my story yeah and and test the waters a little bit how how does that go and if that's if I feel safe and trusted and so I might then share the next layer. So, yeah. you know, this is a process of just sharing parts of our story and that can change over time. You know, yes. we can add to that and maybe over time we can share the, that centre kind of heart of our story. Um, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, there's there's... There's so much in unpacking our stories and, and, to, and to tell them. Um, did you want to talk a bit more about, you know, that, that why it's important to tell our stories, that, that narrative kind of process, Sarah? I do, I do. And there's a few pieces to this. And one of them I wanted to say is that, and I know that everybody on this call will feel this in this, their heart when I say this, is that the experience of being involuntary childless 
is a shame saturated experience. And what shame does is that shame separates and isolates us. And it actually makes us feel like this story won't be held. I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough for my story to actually be told. And sometimes the process of actually healing is gently trying to connect in relation to story. And um, to, to really have a look at the most important point of that is actually how we connect in with our own stories and we start to own our stories. And one of the things that I know, and I apologise to everybody else, I'm going to get a little bit nationalistic here, but I know that you and I, um, Judy, have been trained in narrative therapy, which was, um, it was the, the mode of therapy which was, was developed as one of, one of the international accepted forms of therapy now um, across the psychotherapeutic community. And it was developed by Michael White um, in South Australia. And um, I did some training with Michael White and he was one of the most gentle, beautiful, articulate men that I think I've ever met in my life. And he talked about that the seeds of healing lie in our stories. And when our stories are held, it's an opportunity to go back and, um, and see what are the themes, what is the, looking beyond the content of the story and what is, how has the story landed and how are we conceptualising and thinking through our stories. And what I love about Michael White's work, and this kind of taps in a little bit to where we started this conversation, is that he, um, he originally developed narrative therapy out of his work in Aboriginal communities in South Australia. And so he really linked in with, and he was, you know, taken and educated by Aboriginal elders on, on what is story from Aboriginal Australian perspective and how do we communicate and teach and how do we um, learn and grow through, through story. Um, and he very much talked about what you're, when you're working with story, you're really listening to what's the primary narrative, but then looking at what are the stuck points? What are the exceptions? What are the points of learning and growth? And I know that when I'm working as a therapist, the most important story I'm often listening for is the motherhood narrative. And so sometimes we think that when we talk that through, it's, you know, the number of IVF cycles or when I didn't or what happened at this point. And we can, we can sit at that, that layer. The next layers that we're looking at are then looking at, so how did that impact for you? What have been the losses for you? How did you experience that story? And I know that we've talked a little bit about this, that, that when we're listening as therapists, we're often listening at about seven or eight different layers. So there's a lot going on um, when we're listening to, to stories and we're listening not just to the content and the themes and often we can pick up a thread that we see might have you know started back here I know for example I've worked with um, a number of women who have long-term mental mental illnesses and so their experience of shame and unworthiness has been a long history in their lives of feeling this sense of being othered and feeling a sense of shame and their motherhood narrative might weave together with other stories and threads within their life and often what we're doing is we're listening to the language that's used to construct story. But there might be a tone or a change in a person's tone of voice or their body language. And you're really listening to how is this impacted? There might be particular points in the story where you see somebody rise with excitement and you'll be like, oh, okay, there's something there. And what you're doing, it's almost like you're sitting with this little kind of the the frayed edge of a tapestry and you're sitting there thinking okay which thread will we pull which one and you're looking at the person you're working with and going what's important to you and certainly what you're looking at when you're doing grief therapy and I have to be really honest it, it feels I'm sure a lot of you will relate to this when you're going through grief you can just this sense of being overwhelmed and lost and there's this saying that we have in grief therapy which is follow the effect follow the feelings so when you're looking at what are your way markers, what are the way through this experience, often what we're looking at is 
tracking in with how you're feeling at different points in time and being able to feel and validate and process through those feelings are really important parts of the healing process. And I guess I wanted to say that for us, it's such an honour. It's such an honour. And we do what, there's a wonderful grief therapist called Jay Shep Jeffries, and he talks about that when when we have an opportunity to hear each other's stories, that we become exquisite witnesses to each other's stories, to people's precious stories, and we get a chance to honour those stories. And, um, and I guess I just wanted to, to then have a think about, like, and we've I've seen some chat, some questions in the chat thread, and I'm seeing some comments around people reaching out and telling their stories and receiving comments or lack of response or lack of support. And I guess I just wanted to say telling our stories is a really big risk, isn't it? And certainly the way that the culture rises to receive us and our stories can be pretty toxic. So I guess what I was wondering at this point is what are the conditions? What's, what makes it safe? or unsafe or, or what are the, I guess what are the conditions for telling our stories what what you think you've heard some of the responses that that people might receive and and how do people kind of make sense of that um I know that you have a really lovely way of thinking about this Judy thanks Sarah yeah and and I can see in this the chat thread too you know it's that you know what do we do when we we receive those those hurtful comments what do we do when we receive you know those kind of comments the, the miracle stories and um you know that 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 can just trigger us so much and and go deep into that grief story and and our emotional experience of of loss so yeah, I, I'm a bit of a visual person and um, I've put together this little model um, that kind of paints a picture around the social context uh, that we tell our stories, that we live our stories. And I guess that's what we've been talking a bit about. You know, who do we tell? What do we tell? When? How do we tell? So I'll just share my screen and show you this little model and see see if this lands for people, if it makes sense. So I'll yeah. share my screen. Okay. So hopefully you can see my screen. So, you know, I'm thinking of this is our stories in a social context. So this is kind of my take on an ecological model. So it puts us at the centre of this, of this kind of image and it shows us that we're connected to, you know, the people around us, you know, in that first circle, our closest relationships. And outside of that, you know, our friends or community, you know, colleagues, people that we spend some time with, but we mightn't always tell our deepest, um, most vulnerable stories. And outside of that is another layer of relationship, um, more sort of social systems, um, maybe the, the bigger workplace or the health systems we work in. And outside of that is this, this social context of values and culture that kind of surrounds all of us all of the time. And, you know, I've got pronatalism there in red. Um, so for some of you, you will have heard that term pronatalism before. Um, but if you haven't, and this is a, a new term for you, pronatalism is, you know, it's, it's societal policies and practices, beliefs that prioritise or promote childbearing or parenting. And, you know, if you think of all the messages that we receive in media, in ads, movies, you know, workplaces that prioritise mothers or parents, or make it seem like it's easy, it's natural, it's the only way to be happy or fulfilled. You know, the implicit message we get when we see those messages all the time is that that's the best way to be, or the most valued way to be. And our stories of childlessness tend to be invisible. And so that sends messages also that, that are we, you know, do we matter? 
And so this, this model kind of locates us in this social context and our stories in this social world, um, in this pronatalist kind of culture. And when you look at it and you think that that culture influences people at all levels of our social worlds, that it's, it's little wonder, you know, that it can feel so big to tell our stories. It can feel like we're really pushing against the tide and to share those vulnerable parts of ourselves. So when we think about pronatalism, this is often where those messages of, of shame come in because we're getting these messages all the time and through the different relationships that we have. So the people around us are also saturated in pronatalism. And, you know, so is it, it's kind of little wonder that we, we do often get comments like, mm. you know, why don't you just adopt? Or, you know, I've heard of people falling pregnant at 50, keep going, you know, like, because they're the, they're the messages that the people around us are getting, that this is what the way yeah. the world should be. Yeah. So, you know, I guess this model, what I try to get with this model is these arrows that go back and forth, that we, we are being influenced all the time by our social system, but we also influence those relationships. And we influence our closest relationships and they influence others when we tell our stories. But what we want to do is tell our stories in ways that are really safe for us mm. because we've really identified how mm. vulnerable it can be to tell our story, you know, particularly if it's a little bit more public or it's in a group situation, in a workplace and when we have that vulnerability to be shut down is, is not helpful for our healing and growth. So the next part of, of the, the, the picture, I think is telling our stories on our terms. So this is a little model that you might like to kind of play around with in your own world, with your own relationships. So again, closest to you in that, that closest circle, you know, surround yourself or identify the people in your world who are your safe people, who are trusted, who are your confidence, and maybe their closest friends. They might be some family members. It might be a partner if you have a partner. Um, it might be other childless people that you've become close to and you can share your story of childlessness. And this is where we start because this is what helps us build up you know, our confidence that we can share our story and that they matter. So you can map who, what are the names? Who are those people? And mm. certainly if you don't have someone in that safe, trusted space just yet, that might be a therapist. It might be someone that you can start this journey with. The next circle around that, you know, maybe they're people that when you feel ready, they are people that in your world, in your circle of friends or colleagues that are more compassionate or they're open or they're supportive. You know, I have some friends who have children and do have time. You know, they don't always just talk about the children mm. um, and they ask how I am and they actually get the children babysat and we have time together. You know, they would be people that I'd put in my, my next circle. They're supportive mm. and they mm. show me that through their actions. You know, the next circle out, you know, it's, it's more that community level. Maybe it's different groups that you belong to and you haven't told your childless story or you don't you know, feel comfortable ask, answering those questions like, oh, do you have children? Um, navigating that. You know, this next circle out, you know, where maybe it's a workplace or the people are a bit more neutral, map those people and maybe when you have strength and empowerment, you might start to kind of play around with, I'm going to tell, I'm going to speak up in this situation and say, I'm here and I matter. And then that last layer of kind of mapping those relationships might be the general public, people that are unsupportive or people in your life that are kind of hostile and really shut you down and tell you that, 
you know, just get over it. Mm. Those are the people, identify them, you know, pop them in that outer layer and you don't need to keep pushing uphill and sharing your stories with those mm. people. Yeah. So this is a little model just to map your social context and to try and build safety when you tell your story. I might stop sharing for a moment. You know, I know. It's, it's so interesting because I've heard you say that is that that I almost veered on thinking as people are so soaked and so bathed in pronatalism, it's almost it's not unreasonable, is it, to kind of almost assume that people are likely to not be supportive, almost to kind of go, well, you know, until people have woken up, unless they're exceptionally empathic, yeah, it's very likely that I'm not going to be met well. Um, the other thing I love about what you shared is that it really gives you an opportunity to, to be a little bit more empowered and, and to exercise a level of discernment where you can go actually on this issue, and I love the way that inner circle you could change that to, okay, when it's, when it's me talking about this particular story or part of my life, I might be comfortable to move you a bit closer in. But when I'm talking about my childlessness, I actually get to map that and yeah. to actually be able to, you know, to really give yourself permission to set those boundaries and just say, particularly during the really raw healing years, to realise that you're going through a really significant life transition that was unexpected and you have every right to create sanctuary in your life and really clear boundaries, whether that's around Mother's Day, whether it's around Christmas, whether it's around family events. It's not like you're saying, I will never attend these. It might actually just be, okay, I'm going to need for the next 12 months, the next two years to really focus on my care and my nurture and what I need in, in terms of working through this. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you've just articulated that so beautifully, Judy. It's just, I love that model. Yeah. Yeah, it's those boundaries, isn't it, that, that allows yeah. us to own our own story and, yeah. and move at the pace that we need to. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And sadly, Absolutely. sometimes that process does identify people in our life that we thought would be our safe go-to people and maybe they are about some yeah. other things but that can be a little bit of a grief process as well in terms of process, mapping yes. that and recognizing you know I feel deep sadness that this person in my life hasn't been able to acknowledge my my experience around childlessness and to support me and yeah. that actually maybe they're there I need to place them in one of those outer circles at the moment maybe that'll change maybe it won't but that can be yeah. a little sadness there's yeah. a fluidity there isn't there because those relationships yeah. can expand and contract over time as well can't they yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so I know yeah. you have a model as well that I think just fits really beautifully <laughs> and and this this is you know wrapping up this kind of story that we've been speaking about yeah. tonight around how do we how do we share our story and how do we deal with yeah. you know yeah. the people in our lives so would you like me to share the slide for I'd love you to I'd love you to and and I wanted to flag as well with this that I'm, I'm conscious this this model might also address some of the questions in the question yeah. and answer box as well so one of the questions is um what do we do when 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 we're met with responses that lack empathy um when we do decide to share and I love um Judy's sense of think of it as an onion and you're just sharing the outer layer you're not giving the whole story at this point you just so for example um one of the ways that I used to when people would ask me if I had children I would I would say you know no we don't sadly and so I just put that little fragment in there so they would kind of get that subtle hint that it wasn't by choice and then the conversation might move on but I would gently see how do they what do they do with that how do they respond to that um the other thing I wanted to, to check in is there's another question there around the first time um I tried articulating not having children I met with a lack of understanding if you don't have friends who you can talk to how do you find a therapist with lived experience I think we might come back to that Judy because because we're a bit of a rare breed but it might be good to have a chat about what what we see as being important qualities in therapists. So this, 
model is is a model that we introduced last year when, when Karen from Gateway Women and I did the comments that hurt session and um, we got a chance to, to really talk through that when it comes to your response this is just like a little acronym and each of the letters stands for an aspect to really consider in terms of telling your story and you could do this as a written activity so you could actually if you come back to this video or even write it down but you can actually brainstorm you could think of an event or you could you could think through okay this might be someone that I might like to share this with and think through how these different elements are going to support you in telling your story so the first piece of it is whether it's an incoming comment and you're thinking okay do I tell part of my story or whether it's a situation where maybe you need to go to a supervisor and maybe negotiate leave for um, for a particular reason um, whatever the scenario is the first and the most important thing is you so where are you at what are you feeling and what is it that you're needing right now and recognizing that for us that will be shifting sands there'll be times when we're feeling a, a little bit stronger and there'll be times when we're not and it's okay for us to to not share or to to have very simple answers and there'll be other times when you know we might want to change the topic pretty quickly the second thing and then is to have a think about who is the other person so who's this person who has you know i'm considering sharing with um who are they what state are they in what emotional space are they in um and really having a think through what do i know about this person in terms of have they been someone who's been able to have a level of empathy around other things that are going on in my on in my life is this someone that tends to be a bit self-orientated and tends to you know you know sometimes when you you might tell a piece of a story and someone goes oh that reminds me let me tell you about me and they they bring the conversation back to themselves and you kind of go yeah this might not be somebody who's who's going to be great for me to to share this story with the third thing that is having a think about the context so understanding the context so what's happening in the environment what's the context is it a social situation where someone just asks a question as a conversation opener and it's really good to have some pre-prepared responses or you might even shift to another topic um, for example someone might say do you have kids and you might say no I've got a I've got a niece and a nephew let me tell you about them or let me tell you about the important relationships in my life um, which I know is it's easy to say because often what happens is you're emotionally really triggered but this just gives you a bit of a chance to plan it through a little bit the next thing then is to think about the relationship so who is the person in terms of your level of emotional investment in this relationship what is your hope or intention in relation to that person is it somebody that actually if they bring up anger you feel really comfortable just to tell them to get stuffed and actually it's none of their business and shut them down is it somebody that you hope to, or you've had a level of investment and you're thinking actually maybe I need to take a little bit more time to work through how I tell this story or how I, how I tell my experience to this person um, and then the final thing is to think through what are some skills or some strategies that you can use or that, that might help you in terms of being able to to frame the conversation and and um, and tell your story so one of them is a a model that we use from non-violent communication and it's a four-step model and it's basically particularly in relation to a comment that's been made and the first thing is is to really observe what's just happened what's the information what what's happened the response what's my emotional response has this really really triggered me the next thing which is the third thing is to think through what's my what's my need at this point and what am I actually needing right now it might be that actually right now I actually need to just exit this situation and I need to not be here I need to actually tend to my hurting heart maybe it's been a really traumatic experience where it's really activated a lot of you know adrenaline within you and a real flight or fight response that's actually a, a, a traumatic response and that happens a lot for us we're actually quite traumatized often by the way the culture responds to us and our childlessness and then finally, which is the fourth thing, is to think through 
what's the request that I need to make of this person in relation to the telling of my story? So one of the things that I suggest when it comes to a story with a really important relationship might actually be um, to, to fr before you actually launch into actually telling your story or start telling details of your story to actually say, I'm, I'm needing to find a time and I'm, there's something I want to tell you that's really, really important. And what I don't need you to do is I don't need you to fix. I don't need you to problem solve this. I don't need you to give me advice. This is what I don't need from you in response to this. And then if you can clearly say, and this is what I do need. And what I need is I need for you to sit with me. I need you to hear what I'm saying. I need you to listen. And I need to know perhaps that you care for me and that you care about how hard this has been. And you're going to know because you are super smart, intelligent people. You're going to know, you're going to have a lot of wisdom around what relationships is this going to work in and what relationships is this not going to work in. One of the things I've noticed in my public work when I'm working with people who, are, who aren't childless, a lot of people will say to me, look, I just, I just don't know. I feel like I feel really uncomfortable. I don't know what to say. I don't know what response is needed. And sometimes it can actually be about going, this is what I need from you. This is how I need you to respond to this. Um, another way that you might think about doing it might be to actually potentially even write your story and actually say, look, I, I don't feel comfortable telling you this, but I'd, I'd really like you to read it. And then maybe we can have a talk about it afterwards if you've got any questions. And so it gives them a chance to, rather than just give you their unprocessed, raw comments, sometimes it gives them a chance to think it through. And you might even have some questions where you go, so how do you think that might have been for me? Having listened to this story, how do you think that I might have experienced that? Or what is it that you think that I need from you? Um, so being able to give yourself some time and space and to kind of plan through if you're, if you're thinking about sharing your stories with others. I guess the thing I wanted to say is these are just suggestions. These are just ideas. There's going to be times when this works and it's going to shift the conversation in a really constructive, healing way. And there's going to be times perhaps it's not going to work. There's no magic wand. There's no panacea. As you know, you're, you know, you're, deeply wise people who know what it means to be in relationship with others and um yeah i really support you to 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 try some things out and just see what works in terms of your relationships so judy i'm just really conscious we've, we've come up to the hour and uh yeah i'm just wondering well, there's some really juicy good Good questions in the chat this might be a really good time to to flick it across and, and see where we're up to oh thank you both so much for that talk and that presentation i think the slides are really important as well that people can actually put themselves there and decide who their inner circle is yes so i'd like to get copies of them from you please so that people can print them off and actually adapt them for themselves at home you know, because like you say, it's like an onion of other people and an onion of ourselves. Yeah. And it is like you yeah. say, the layers go in both directions and it's up to us where we choose and pick. Yes. To release ourselves, to feel safe. And that's yeah. so important. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's it. It's such a process. It's, you know, it's just kind of one layer at a time. And as we do that, we build up our confidence and become more empowered. Mm. that's this part of the from healing you know from hurting to healing isn't it you know yeah. slowly building up our sense of self I yes. think it's also remembering as well that sometimes you think you've got to a certain stage you go uh oh I need to put that layer back on again and it's completely yep. normal and acceptable to do that and we forget sometimes because like why do I feel so bad today when I felt great yesterday and then you feel guilty for feeling the way you feel because you don't feel like you should have gone back a step but it's actually yeah. completely natural. So, yeah. Yeah. I think that's what's so nice about that little model, isn't it? That it reminds us that we we can feel different on different days. And also, depending on the person we're interacting with, you know, they yeah. 
what are they bringing that's maybe making us feel less strong or less confident yeah. you know what what is it that's yeah. coming back yeah. and and that's what I'm kind of picking up in some of the comments and the questions it's like how do you deal with that you know those comments that are, are not understanding and are not helpful you know that's that's this this challenge for us isn't it I think that's what a lot of the questions like you say you sort of reacted to them as you went along and it is a case that that first introduction of that question into your space really and yeah there's so many external feelings and emotions that depend on how you answer but it's accepting that if you do just want to say no the simplest word of no that it's not for you to then make that person feel comfortable because they asked mm. the question which mm. I think we often go um, um, backtrack and we try and fill the void with more to our answer which we don't always need to do mm. yeah 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 I think that's a process though isn't it you know like that 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 question that when we're right in that initial stage of rawness that you know being asked in a, a social situation so do you have kids you know this again the pronatalism everyone just wears that lens that thinks oh that's the way that you are but you know in the initial stages it might just be oh no I don't and you're kind of just doing everything you can to shut the conversation down because you feel yeah. so triggered and raw but over time, getting that emotional support from trusted people that are safe, then, you know, we can kind of build up some responses to those questions, yeah. can't we? And it might become, like you said, Sarah, it might be, become, no, we, sadly, we don't have kids. And it might invite to an empathic person, oh, are you okay? Tell me more. You know, mm. but over time that might even become, you know, well, you know, I don't have kids, but, um, you know, these are the other things I have in my life and, and I have a really good life. It's not always easy, but I have a good life and it's full. And do you want to talk about some of those things? <laughs> you know, like our, yeah. our responses can really change, but, but that's about yeah. our healing process alongside it, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I certainly noticed that, that when as the grief as you're working through the grief that that yeah that where you're at in terms of what you want to say your responses can can really vary and I guess I wondered there's a couple of questions that I thought we could answer one of them is asking how the responses we get from from parents and my answer to that really quickly is um I work exclusively I think you do as well don't you Judy with involuntary childless clients that's We've, we certainly, um, that's our, our specialist practice area. Um, and uh, the other thing uh, that I quickly wanted to respond to is that somebody asked about, what do you say if someone suggests you should be over this by now? And that you shouldn't see a counsellor as surely that's digging up old painful feelings and that you have so much to be happy for and you shouldn't dwell on this. And this person is your mother. So I wanted to say to that, and there's this thing that I wanted to talk to you about, which is around grief therapy. So this is the thing that in grief therapy, when we're taught grief therapy, one of the things that they'll do is that they'll teach you, for example, if you have somebody who's got a really significant relationship and someone has died, is they will suggest to you to basically invite that person in a way to bring their story, their experiences, their memories of that person, to bring them into the room and bring them to life and give them permission to talk as much about that person as possible. Because that idea of digging up old feelings is actually about you don't go back through time to dig up old feelings. Those feelings are actually already there. What you're doing is that... Um, somebody said this to me it was very interesting and they said oh people you know they they need to talk about their pain and they need to talk about it now and they never used to do that and I said to them do you think they weren't experiencing pain and they said oh no I'm sure they're experiencing pain so I said so basically what you're saying is that you don't want to know you want them to still be in pain but to be alone with their feelings and, and that, that you're not actually necessarily wanting to be supportive of that person um and, you know, that's the truth of it is that some people don't want to go there or don't know how to go there. Um, 
and it can be really helpful to go, okay, this person isn't supportive for me. And uh, like Judy said, there may be some work there to, to grieve perhaps your expectations of that relationship and, and the support you might have hoped for in that relationship that isn't there, which isn't to say that you give up the relationship completely. It might be that I'm actually having to grieve this aspect of that relationship. The other thing that I wanted just to address in the first half of that question is that this idea of grieving and getting over it and letting go, and this is really important. I know this isn't a grief and loss um, session. Maybe that's what we might do next year, Judy. <laughs> but um, the idea of letting go, moving on, is a very old version of grief. And what that is is that goes all the way back to Freud which is this idea of decathexis, which is basically you grieve intensely, you get over it and you're done. There are some really clear grief models now that really address this. And what we experience is a living loss. Um, it's also called a non-finite loss in that the losses aren't just once, they actually happen over and over and over and over. And so what happens in grief is that you have a loss it has an emotional impact, which is grief. And so that loss is actually a loss that we can experience over our lives. There'll be some people who are able to grieve and they get over it, and that's their nature. There's other people that that won't happen. It will be an ongoing loss that they experience. It might become more of a scar than a really open wound, but that if, if that happens for you, that is actually completely normal that's really important for you to hear is that that doesn't make you defective. There's nothing wrong with you. If this is a loss that you experience and you live with um, throughout the remainder of your years, and it may not be as intense as it is now. It might shift. You might keep to get to different places with it. Um, but what you may end up with is, is a form of grief that we call chronic sorrow. So chronic sorrow is a form of grief that's a low level, you're still able to function in the world, but it's a low level grief that sits with you over a really, really long extended period of time. And so it's really helpful for you to know when someone's saying that to me, they're actually quite ignorant. They actually don't know what they're talking about. And so to be able to actually go, this person's not informed. And so if you're able to get yourself informed, that's a really important starting point around the grief experience. Yeah, you can definitely come back next year and do a session. Oh. On <laughs> First webinar for next year, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I was going to say, oh my goodness, we just want to go there. There's so much to talk about. <laughs> There's so much to talk about, Judy. We're going to have to so I have, to have a crack at that next year, I think. <laughs> yeah. But no, yeah. thank you so much for the session today. I think it's been really yeah. helpful to a lot of people in different ways. So yeah, I appreciate both of you being here. So Sarah, Thank you. Judy, we could talk all day, but unfortunately we can't. We could. So thank you very much. Really appreciate you being here today. And I hope you'll join in with World Charles yeah. Week over the next coming days as well. And sending a huge yeah. healing hug to all of you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Yes. Thanks both. And thanks, thanks so much for all the work that you've done pulling this together, Steph. We really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for joining in with all the comments and the questions. Yeah, you're it's, amazing. Yeah, it's been wonderful. And, yes, all registered for the next events coming up, 16 <laughs> free webinars in World Child oh this week. It's God. amazing. <laughs> this is a festival, Stephanie Joy Phillips. <laughs> it is. <That's> joy. <laughs> Love it. Oh, so right. exciting. Don't, don't worry. That's brilliant. No, I appreciate all the support and all the love. And I shall see you all again shortly. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye. Thanks, Thanks all. Steph. Bye. Bye.